welcome to Chet Talks. Today is a great, great treat. We have Senator Tom Daschle as our guest from Aberdeen, South Dakota to the United States Senate. Senator Tom Daschle has been a tireless advocate, leader, and public servant. After graduating from South Dakota State University, Senator Daschle served as an intelligence officer in the United States Air Force. He then began his political career as a congressman before serving three terms in the U.S. Senate. There, his peers elected him first Senate Minority Leader and then Senate Majority Leader. After departing the Senate, he was an early supporter and advisor to Senator and then President Barack Obama. Senator T Tom Daschle has authored or co-authored at least five books, including this one, Critical, in 2008, in which he argued for universal health insurance. He has long advocated for telemedicine, aging Americans, and Parkinson's disease, and was even kind enough to endorse our book, uh, Ending Parkinson's Disease. Today, Senator uh, Daschle serves as the founder and chairman of the Daschle Group, where he provides clients with strategic public policy advice. It's an honor and delight to welcome you, Senator uh, Daschle. Thank you, Ray. It's great to be with you. And let me just say how much I've admired your leadership and your indefatigable work over these many years on so many issues we both care a lot about. But it's great to join you. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, so we're in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic, Senator. What is the U.S. doing well? Well, I think there are a number of things that we're doing well. First and foremost, let me give a shout out, and I know you would too, to all of our healthcare providers on the front line. I tell you, their commitment and their dedication, their willingness to put their lives on the line in many cases, deserves special recognition and critical, critical praise. I'd say much the same of Tony Fauci. I think that some of the uh, willingness on the part of the American people to accept social distancing and the lockdown has been important. Vaccine development uh, is underway and we're hoping that we're going to break all records in terms of a, a capacity for vaccine production at some point uh, in the future. And then I would, I would just say the congressional response has been laudable. Four packages thus far, totaling over three trillion dollars. And I'd finally have to add the Fed. I think the Fed has done an outstanding job over these last four or five months. So what hasn't gone well? Well, there's a lot that hasn't gone well too. And we all recognize that. The early testing, uh, our inability to deal with the early testing, uh, our inability to acquire the necessary number of masks and PPEs, uh, CDC confusion, a lot of bureaucratic stumbling, that has always been for me, one of the greatest disappointments. We lack a national plan for testing, and I think that ought to be uh, a much higher priority than it is. There is no international coordination either. We're tending to blame China and others, and I'm not sure that, gonna, that will get us very far. I, I think it's really critical that we recognize this isn't just a national challenge, it's an international one, and we need to step up to the plate and provide real leadership. Uh, the decision to pull out of the World Health Organization was a big mistake and, a, and a, real, a real problem, it seems to me, for not only the country's uh, efforts at dealing with international issues, because we can't isolate ourselves, but the world's as well. And then I think uh, the, the push for normalization too early has also not served us well. We're now talking about major events in other parts of the country that will bring people together uh, in a very unsafe way. All of those things, I think, are issues that I wish we could address more effectively. So let's take on testing. If we had testing, it'd be a lot easier to open businesses. It'd be a lot easier to open schools. It'd be a lot easier to care for nursing home residents. It'd be also a lot easier to know exactly how many people in the United States are infected and what policies we should be employing. Why can't we have wide, large-scale testing? Well, that's a great question, Ray, and I think, I think you probably know the answer as well as I do, but I think for our purposes today, I, I would say that, and I would, I, when we ask, when we talk about testing, I think we also really have to include contact tracing because they go hand in glove. We've got to have an effective program for testing, contract trace, tracing, and, and uh, uh, quarantine, of course, but we don't have a national plan. We have 50 plans that are not very coordinated, that are uh, and oftentimes competing with one another, uh, problems that uh, uh, break down our ability to, to develop a cohesive approach with all the travel and communication and movement in this country. If we don't have a national plan, 
that in and of itself is really our biggest obstacle. But lack of funding. We only have a fraction of the funding necessary for testing and for contact tracing today. And there's no transparent supply line for domestic manufacturing. So much of what we rely on for testing comes from foreign sources. And that too is a, is a major problem. Uh, so what should the federal government do right now? Well, there's a lot of things the government really should do. First and foremost, as I said at the beginning, we really need a national plan. Uh, I, I think there, there appears to be a difference of opinion uh, uh, in Washington uh, about the importance of that national plan. President Trump has made his position quite clear. He believes it's really a state responsibility and the federal government has no role other than just backing up uh, the state's effort. We need more funding. We need that transparent supply line. I think that's really critical. We need to make telehealth uh, regulation waivers permanent, the ones that, and we'll probably get into that in a little bit, but, but that's part of what the federal government needs to do. One of the things that we, you and I've talked about in the past uh, to a certain extent that I really hope gets a, the attention and the priority it deserves is public health and the need for public health funding. Over 50,000 public health uh, officials at the local level have lost their jobs in the last 10 years. And so we have a real deficit with regard to our public health infrastructure that needs to be addressed. We have to ensure that tests are, are provided to in, in, in those areas where they're most needed. Uh, we don't have the same need across the entire country, and we've got to make sure that uh, we put those tests where they're needed the most. Accountability is really important. Who's getting them and, and how this is all being uh, administered is, is a very important part of it, too. And then certainly we've got to do more for community health centers. Community health centers are really one of the foundations of our public health system, and uh, they're desperately uh, working today to meet the new demands, but they don't have the resources, they don't have the funding, they don't have the support necessary from Washington to do the job that they're really designed to do so well. They serve well over 30 million people, as you know, and uh, we need to just do a lot better job of recognizing their role and making sure that we support it with adequate funding and, and, uh, and personnel. Tied to COVID-19 uh, has been a clear recognition of the role of disparities in the United States. Uh, African Americans are dying at twice the rate of whites. Uh, what needs to change to improve the health of all Americans? Well, there's a lot of a lot of things that you're absolutely right. That I think I would just start with the economics around the inequities that exist. Medial wealth for white families today is 20 times that of black families. That's really a phenomenal statistic. 38% of prisoners are black with only 13% of the country's population. COVID is, as you say, affected black people and minorities, uh, black and brown, uh, far more consequentially. I think we've got to find ways with which to ensure that as we look at healthcare generally, uh, that we make uh, ex healthcare a lot more accessible and affordable. Um, I think that means expanding Medicaid, especially. There are still, I think it's 13 states that haven't expanded the Medicaid program. But we've got to set as a goal a robust universal health insurance coverage uh, uh, agenda. And I, I, I don't, we've talked about it for generations. We just haven't done enough to make it the reality. But that robust universal health insurance coverage has got to be priority number one. Uh, in order for us to deal with COVID, but in order for us especially to deal with all the inequities that we have in healthcare today. We've got to eliminate the work requirement for the Medicaid program that has now been promulgated in several states. That just doesn't make sense. Uh, we've got to make the Affordable Care Act uh, more accessible uh, with increasing tax credits and premium subsidies. We've got to expand, uh, as I said earlier, the community health program, community health center program. Uh, we've got to deal with drug prices. Public health funding has to be given a higher priority. And, uh, uh, and we've just got to do more to ensure that, uh, that the basic three challenges we face in health, access, cost, and quality, are all given uh, more than just the lip service that sometimes they get. 
you started with economic disparity, citing that uh, white families have 20 times the wealth of African American ones. Uh, Hispanics, African Americans, other minorities are bearing the large burden of furloughs and layoffs, including in healthcare. Uh, these are occurring even though relatively few individuals were in positions of leadership to design systems that would be resilient to uh, things like COVID. Uh, what needs to change on the economic front? Well, there's a lot of things that are, are just essential. I would start with just starting with COVID and you know, the CARES Act had a very uh, successful unemployment compensation program that it expires uh, next month. And I think it ought to be extended through the end of the year. Maybe not at the same rate, maybe we can modify it in ways that uh, adapt now to the current circumstances, but that's been an invaluable program for ensuring that people have some sort of a safety net. Increasing the minimum wage to $15 is a no-brainer. That's really essential. Uh, Providing universal health care coverage is an economic issue, not just a health issue. And uh, the more we can recognize it as both economic and health, uh, the more successful we're going to be. I think we've got to ensure that we deal with social determinants in health. We're not very effective in this country. We've minimized the role of social determinants uh, where other countries have recognized their importance and put a lot more emphasis on organization and infrastructure around social determinants than we have. Access to a good education is really essential. We don't uh, have as much of a recognition from a public policy perspective of the federal responsibility here. Only 7% of education in elementary and secondary education comes from the federal government. It ought to be more. And then finally, uh, needless to say, after what we've seen over the last uh, several weeks in particular, uh, we have to prioritize civil justice reform, including a, a complete reorganization of police departments. And that's something obviously we recognize as a local and state responsibility, but it also uh, have uh, great ramifications nationally and we ought to treat it as a national challenge as well. So you mentioned the social dispar disparities, you alluded to the death of uh, George Floyd and many others. Uh, what needs to change on that front? Well, I, I think that there's a whole range of things that uh, we have to do. And, and I, I think there's a direct tie to what we've already been talking about. If we can address the economic and the health uh, responsibilities that we have at the federal level and the national level, if we address these inequities and disparities, if we really put a new infrastructure in place, both economically and with regard to our, our health infrastructure, I think we can address many of the uh, the uh, uh, civil justice issues as well. But we've got to recognize from a civil justice point of view that uh, I've been very, very concerned about the uh, efforts in some states to limit voting uh, and voting rights. Uh, I was terribly disturbed by the Supreme Court decision that the Voting Rights Act was really no longer necessary. Uh, we've got to deal with corporate hiring and promotion. As I'm told, only three of the Fortune 500 companies today have uh, minority leadership, have, have black leadership. And I think we've got to address corporate hiring as well. But education, drug policy needs to be addressed, and the reformation, top to bottom of our police departments are all high and important candidates if we're going to really address the social disparities that exist now. We have already over 100 participants online. Uh, as a reminder, we'll have be taking questions uh, from uh, all, our, all our listeners with Senator Daschle uh, in probably like 15 or 20 minutes. So please have those questions coming. Telemedicine is how we first met. Uh, you have long been a proponent of uh, telemedicine. Six years ago, you and your colleagues formed the Alliance for Connected Care to address policy barriers to telemedicine. You have long said that telemedicine can bring a death to distance. However, it took a public health emergency for the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services to greatly expand coverage, at least temporarily. Why did it take a pandemic for action to occur? Well, as you know, it's somewhat of a trite expression, Ray, but uh, it's often said that necessity is the mother of invention. Well, we really didn't need invention here, but this necessity has driven us to recognize how critical telemedicine uh, can be and how important it is all over the world, uh, but especially here in the United States, in both urban and, and rural settings. And so I'm very encouraged by this 
broad, new broad-based understanding and recognition of telemedicine's uh, critical role and the opportunities it can play in addressing many of the challenges we've already discussed. So you highlighted the big statistic about uh, health dis about wealth uh, disparities. So the here's one for you: uh, the number of Medicare beneficiaries using telehealth has increased a hundredfold, a hundred in hundredfold increase in telehealth used by Medicare beneficiaries in six weeks. Uh, yesterday, a bipartisan group of 30 senators, led by Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii and Roger Wicker from Mississippi, called for the temporary changes uh, that you alluded to early on to become permanent. What are the prospects for such action? Actually, I think they're improving. I, I wouldn't say at this point they're good. I, I think they could be good, but they're certainly improving. Just because of, of what you've just cited as a, as a, just a, a, a really uh, impressive statistic about utilization, that utilization isn't gonna go away anytime soon. And I think we've already shown the value of the changes that have been made regulatorily and statutorily in, in uh, the last uh, three months as a result of the need for, for innovative thinking about how we can address the COVID challenges we're facing. So a wider recognition, broader bipartisan support, uh, an understanding that these regulatory changes have made a big difference, have all added to the environment legislatively and politically that I think could make a difference. I'm still not 100% confident that they'll be made permanent, but I'm much more confident today than I would have been 90 days ago. Who will stop it? Well, I think there's, there's you know, we have traditional opposition that comes from uh, uh, certain providers who, uh, who value the, the personal role they have and the opportunities that they've had to provide care physically. I think, I think there are a lot of people who still view this to be more of a state responsibility that it ought to be left to the states and not the federal government. So there'll always be excuses and always be, and I don't mean to minimize the excuses. I think that they're, they're legitimate concerns and, and issues, but I, I think we've already demonstrated that we can, uh, we can effectively uh, deal with their concerns and still maintain a far more robust infrastructure around telemedicine than we've ever had before. Do you think Medicare will follow the VA and allow patients to receive care from clinicians licensed in any state? I do. I think that's going to be one of the reforms that is almost a necessity. I don't think we can see the full value and potential of telemedicine without that change. That change would really open up uh, not only the access to care, and, and here I would emphasize, as I know uh, you have done many times, uh, we're talking about both mental health and physical health. And I think uh, they're equally as important. And I think the more we can ensure that people in, 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 in my, my state of South Dakota, for example, that have had very limited access to many providers, especially on the mental health side, will have access to people all over the country who can provide them with the care and the quality of care that is so essential. So uh, that is an essential component of the reform that I think is increasingly recognized. I think uh, if my geography serves me correctly, Aberdeen as South Dakota is right near the border of North Dakota. So you could have Aberdeen residents right now not be able to receive care from a psychiatrist in North Dakota. We're 40 miles from the border of North Dakota and 80 miles from the border of Minnesota. So you're absolutely right. Therein lies a great opportunity to access providers in those two states, not to mention the other 48. Uh, in your 2000 book, uh, 2008 book, uh, Critical, another plug for it, uh, you wrote, the time has come finally to fix our broken healthcare system. Since then, the novel coronavirus has exposed even more flaws, including that healthcare insurance is tied to employment. Uh, you allude this early on that when people lose their employment, as 30 million Americans have, uh, they either qualify for Medicaid or are left uh, uninsured. Uh, has the time come to finally uh, fix our broken healthcare system? Well, the time is long past uh, for <laughs> us to fix the broken healthcare system, Ray. As you, as you so well know and so eloquently spoken on the issue for for a long period of time, you know we've had a 
a now a, about a three and a half trillion dollar public private partnership that has been our infrastructure in healthcare. We've got no one system, we've got a collage of subsystems in healthcare and in some ways that's a strength, but in many ways it's a weakness. We've got to figure out ways to make that collage work a lot better in the future. We've got to ensure that we can uh, still build on on what we've been able to, to do with the Affordable Care Act. I, I look back with satisfaction that Medicaid has been expanded, that at least 20 million Americans are getting care, that weren't getting it before through the Affordable Care Act, but we've got a lot more work to do to make it more fair, to make it more equitable, more accessible, and less costly. It's still the most costly system in the world. And if we don't address that more effectively, uh, I, I really worry about whether we'll ever have a true universal coverage mechanism. So on that, one of our listeners, Jan Jernica, asks, what's your view of the best path forward to making healthcare more accessible to all? Well, I'm a pragmatist. I, you know, there are ideal solutions and there are pragmatic solutions. I think what we've got to do is to build on what we've got. I, I think that's the fastest and most certain way. Building on what we've got means uh, making many of the improvements that I've already mentioned in the Affordable Care Act, increasing the subsidy, making sure that the tax credits are available to more people, expanding Medicaid to all 50 states, uh, but lowering the threshold for uh, for meaningful participation and doing everything we can and having uh, in many cases where uh, insurance is, is, uh, is not available, uh, a public option so that we really can expand coverage far beyond where it is today. Those are the kinds of things that I think we have to do to ensure that we, we build on this public-private partnership in a way that truly could achieve universal coverage. You didn't mention Medicare for all. Well, I, I think that's a bridge too far, frankly. I, I, I think uh, it would be, um, you know, if we make that the goal and make the, the, the perfect, the enemy, the good, we'll, we'll, we'll never get there. I think we've got to build on the public-private partnership that exists today, and I think we can do that effectively. We're going to take some questions in just a moment. Uh, in five months, uh, Senator Dasher, we have national elections to shape our country's future. Vice President Joe Biden looks like he'll be the Democratic nominee for president. For 18 years, you served with him in the U.S. Senate. Uh, can you tell us something about him that we don't know? <laughs> well, there's, there's a lot of memories with Joe Biden. We go back a long time. What you probably don't know is that we both arrived in Washington the same year, 1973. He was a newly elected United States Senator at 30 years old, and I was a newly appointed member of a newly elected United States Senator whose name was Jim Averesk, uh, and uh, I was 23 years old. So I followed his career. Uh, Senator Averesk and Senator Biden were uh, served on, on, on the Judiciary Committee together, and so I got to watch him uh, very closely. I went, watched as he went through his, his tragic uh, loss of his family, uh, part of his family, and, and uh, so that's one story that, uh, that uh, not many people probably know. The other story that's probably real inside baseball, but I'll share it with you. When I ran for majority leader, well, I should say when I ran for Democratic leader in 1994, 1993, um, he wasn't one of my supporters. Uh, he was supporting uh, my opponent. And uh, when I got elected, um, he said, uh, you know, I didn't support you, but I'm gonna support you now and I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure you're successful. He said, one thing I think you should do, since you didn't have the support of any of the uh, chairs of, of, our, our, of the Senate, uh, except for one, um, I, I think you ought to meet with us once, once a week, every Wednesday, and, and uh, develop that relationship and develop a cohesion. I took Joe's advice, and it was one of the smartest things I did. So for 10 years, every Wednesday, I had a meeting uh, with each of the chairs or ranking members of, of the Senate. And uh, that was Joe Biden's idea. And I don't think he ever missed a meeting. Um, do you have other thoughts on the election that has a, that's before us? Well, I, I think it goes without saying, but it's so important, I'll say it anyway, that it has to be one of the most important, if not the most important elections of our lifetime. I really, I don't mean for this to sound like it's hyperbole or hyperbolic, but I, uh, I worry about the future of our democracy. I worry about the rule of law. I worry about uh, our ability to govern and our capacity for governance. I worry a lot 
about our role in the world. I worry about the economic and health disparities and racial disparities that exist today that are being exacerbated in so many ways today. I worry about all of that. So this election is absolutely critical. And I, I can't think of, 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 of uh, any election, even the ones that I, 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 where I was a candidate, they were more important than the ones, uh, than the, the one we're, we're going to have in November. So we got a mixture of uh, healthcare questions and I think some uh, political ones as well. Uh, Mary Beth Arzark uh, asks, do you believe that tackling the three needs, access, costs, and quality should finally, fundamentally be at the federal or state level? Well, uh, fundamentally, I think it should be at both levels, but I do think that it, if, if there's a lion's share, I think it ought to be a federal program. We need a national program. Uh, no state, especially rural, small rural states like mine, have the capacity to do this themselves. So the need for a national infrastructure, the need for more of a systematic approach, the need for an infrastructure that recognizes the broad diversity within our country, and the recognition, of course, that people move and travel, and, and uh, we're so mobile these days that it is, it is increasingly uh, apparent, I think, to virtually everybody that a major federal role is critical. And I shouldn't, I don't, and I don't mean to, uh, the question asked uh, sort of a, bi, a, 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 bi, a bilineal question, federal or state, I would, I would add the private sector. We need the private sector's engagement as well in, in all capacities, but clearly it should be largely a national infrastructure. Uh, Austin Lynn asks for your thoughts about the impact of COVID on, the, on mental health both from a social and public health perspective? Well, I've seen reports, and I can't quote them uh, off the cuff, but I've seen reports about how mental health challenges and issues have gone up dramatically. Uh, Ray, you may, may even have them uh, uh, more at, at, at your disposal than I do, but there's been a dramatic increase in, in mental health challenges and issues, uh, uh, illness, then, uh, perhaps we've ever seen in, in, in recent times. And that's understandable. Uh, people's circumstances have changed dramatically. We've got over 40 million people unemployed. We've got major problems with regard to uh, health access uh, across the board. So it's probably uh, an understandable set of circumstances, but we, I don't think it gets the attention. I, I, I tr I'm troubled by that. Uh, far more attention has been put on as, as and understandably so on testing, on contact tracing, and on COVID-related physical issues than COVID-related medical or mental issues. My friend and colleague, Dr. Benzi Kluger asks, is there anything that can be done about the pandemic of misinformation that has complicated public policy decision-making? Well, he raises a very, very good question. And I, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to, uh, to do as good a job of, 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 of making sure that we are uh, relying on good sources. Uh, you know, I, I do think that the CDC, uh, for all of its mistakes and issues and disappointments, uh, I think have, have uh, uh, you know, provided a, a meaningful informational service. Tony Fauci and the, uh, just the NEH role that they played uh, uh, just uh, just uh, across the board, I would say some of our officials in government um, have done a, a very good job. Some of the mainstream media, in my view, have also done a good job. I give uh, high marks to uh, the Times, the, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, uh, NPR. Uh, they've all done a very good job as well. But we've got to be cognizant of the misinformation, especially in social media that pervades so much of what we, we see today. Uh, Joseph Lair uh, highlights some of your uh, longstanding bipartisan uh, public initiatives, including on telemedicine. And he asks, do you see any way to persuade uh, more of your Republican colleagues to break with the president on health related issues? Well, I wish I would see more, frankly. I, I, uh, I must say, I give uh, my former colleague uh, and dear friend Bill Frist, a lot of credit. The uh, 
He has an excellent podcast called The Second Opinion that I highly recommend if people haven't listened to it. Uh, but uh, he has been very forthcoming and very engaged and, uh, and, and courageous oftentimes in many of the things he's, he's said. Uh, I don't see that same level of courage and, and uh, willingness to remain independent uh, from those who still serve. And I, I think uh, the checks and balances uh, within uh, our federal infrastructure in particular uh, are, are, are suffering as a result. Uh, we need that congressional oversight. We need that congressional engagement. We need far more congressional independence. And uh, I don't see it to the degree I wish I could uh, on the Republican side in both the House or the Senate. Uh, Joseph Larry asks, asks as a follow-up, can industry help with that? No question. I think it's important for, you know, we, this is an election year and people are very sensitive to how they are viewed. Uh, among their constituencies, and a very important part of their constituency is is the corporate and the business world. Uh, I think that the more they could be more vocal and step up and be more expressive and and demonstrate their expectations about this 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 need for more checks and balance and more more of an engaged uh, Congress, I think it would be very very helpful. And just a note, uh, Senator Bill Frist, the cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, I think succeeded you as Senate Majority Leader. He did. Um, and I will put a, a link to his uh, podcast uh, in the chat. Um, Danny uh, Grodsky asks, what can large for-profit healthcare companies like payers and pharmaceutical companies do to have the largest impact on COVID, especially around uh, health inequities? Well, I think there are a lot of things they can do and, and frankly are doing. I give uh, great credit to many of them who have stepped forward and gone beyond what they have been traditionally required to do in order to provide more service and, and, uh, and greater care. Obviously, vaccine development is critical. We have a number of projects underway. We're going to go to phase three trials this summer. I, I think it's important that we always emphasize safety as we as we uh, look at new product development and vaccines especially. We've got a lot of work to do in contact tracing that still is yet to be done. We need 150,000 contact tracers at least. There's a real role for the private sector. Home healthcare in particular could play a, a vital role in doing more on contact tracing and quarantine for that matter. Uh, I think that there are services that could be provided around testing as well. Um, uh, a number of our, our uh, very highly regarded uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, um, are, I, and I, I won't mention them, but I, I, I give them credit for their role in testing and the testing availability. But we've, we've really got to recognize that this has to be as much of a public-private partnership as possible. We built our whole infrastructure around that premise. And so the better it works, the more coordination there is, the more effective communication, and the more important role that we can play at a national, as well as state and local level, uh, the more we can accomplish together. That has to be recognized both in the corporate and private world, as well as in the government world. And I think we still have a ways to go in maximizing uh, that, uh, that opportunity. Nina Mintz asks, uh, says that Medicaid and Medicare do not cover physicians' operating costs. How does universal health care cover the costs that physicians incur while providing uh, the best service to patients? Well, we're going to have to look at, obviously, uh, reimbursement issues have been a source of great frustration and confusion and, uh, and uh, challenge as, as we've seen the Medicare and Medicaid programs evolve. Um, I, I would say that I think we've got to be more efficient. We've got to figure out ways it isn't that we don't spend enough, we just don't spend the money in the right places oftentimes. I think we're too technology reliant sometimes. I, I think uh, I always have looked at healthcare in any country as a pyramid. We're at the base of the pyramid. We have good public health and primary care and we, uh, we, in, we in, in, in go up the, uh, uh, the incline on the pyramid to at the very top, we have the most technological applications, heart transplants and MRIs. Um, most countries start at the base of the pyramid with public health and, and good primary care, and they work their way up. Uh, for the most part, we start at the top of our pyramid and we work our way down. 
And uh, we don't get to good primary health and, and, uh, and public health as much as I think we should. So we've got to recognize that full pyramid if we're going to provide care. And reimbursement is a very big part of how we do that well. Uh, so there's a lot of wrong fees for wrong services. Just a, an, an anecdote, uh, Medicare pays about $20,000 for a hip replacement and about $100 for a visit to see a Parkinson's specialist. I think I figured out one time I'd have to see patients for a month uh, to cover, to, uh, to, to get uh, the same cost as it would be for a hip replacement. That's a perfect example, Ray, at the top of the pyramid and bottom of the pyramid. That's got to change. Uh, another question on the digital divide. Uh, someone asked, how do you deal with the social economic barriers to participating in telemedicine? Well, I think we've got to deal with broadband access, uh, especially. We, we still have a lot of work to do. We've made some progress, but uh, there are many parts of the country, urban and rural, that don't have adequate broadband access. And unless you have sufficient broadband access, you can't really have sufficient telemedicine. So I think that's fundamentally uh, uh, essential to ensuring that we do a better job in providing better access to telemedicine. But we also have to continue to make it affordable. One of the advantages of telemedicine is, and no one knows this better than you, is it's affordability generally. But I think we've got to make sure that regardless of circumstances, we can access it. It ought to be a, uh, a, a service that is provided in, in every health insurance plan, public and private. And today we can't say that that's the case. And to your point, 20% of Americans lack uh, broadband access and 20% of Americans don't have a smartphone. Uh, switching gears, Sarah Jones says that she worries about student loans. It impacts people staying in the healthcare field and impacts new providers. Do you see any hope for student loan forgiveness like Student Debt Emergency Relief Act introduced by Representative Omar in March? I wish I could say that I see relief coming soon. I, I do think there's a, thanks to those leaders and others, there is a far broader recognition of the importance of this challenge than we've seen before. Uh, I, I, uh, I think we will see Congress attempt to address it over the years. I, I don't think as much as I would like to see it addressed in, in this Congress or the next one, I, I think it may be a little ways off. I, I must say part of it depends on the degree to which uh, the next administration, whether it's Trump or Biden, uh, put, uh, put their support and their priority around it. If an administration comes in recognizing its importance and its priority, uh, it's more likely to get done. So uh, let's hope that the next administration uh, will make it a priority and we can expedite and accelerate the progress in making it happen. Stephen Farber asks about caregivers. Given the changing demographics and the critical role that family and other informal caregivers play in healthcare, how do we more actively engage them in delivery of care by extending benefits and or compensation to them? Well, I think we've, we've talked about a number of reforms that are really essential and I don't think we can possibly expect caregivers to be able to, to maintain uh, even their their current ability to serve if we don't recognize the need for meaningful reform. That's payment reform, it's reimbursement reform, it's coverage reform, it's a recognition of the need to address uh, the whole pyramid and public health. I mean, we've got a lot of effort that uh, has gone unaddressed and in large measure, it's affected caregivers more than almost anybody. So it, it's a recognition, I think, that, that again, I go back to my earlier assertion, if, uh, if the President of the United States makes it a priority, it'll become a national priority, and that may be the most important thing we do if we're ever going to see it happen. I'm just going to, uh, before we wrap up, I want to show uh, who has a tough job of uh, following you as a speaker. Uh, very tough act to follow, but uh, next week, Jennifer Goldsack and our friends at the Digital Medicine Society formed uh, recently last year are going to be talking about the importance of meaningful patient engagement. Dan Greber Medin is then going to talk about the digital health financial landscape. Dr. Robert Califf, the former FDA commissioner, will then talk to us about drug development in the digital age. And Charlotte Ye, the chief medical officer of AARP, is going to talk about reimagining aging uh, with technology. Uh, Robert, uh, Howard Rice had the same last question that I had for you, Senator Daschle. 
You look good. You're young in spirit and young in, uh, in heart and health. You look, uh, look like you're fit. Would there be a role for Senator Tom Daschle in, in a Biden administration? <laughs> well, that, that would be up to President Biden uh, if there is such a thing. But I, I, um, I, I enjoy the roles that I currently have. I'm very, very busy. I love the, all the things I'm doing right now. So uh, I think in some unpaid form, I'd be happy to participate and be involved. Uh, Joe's been an old friend for now 40 years. Uh, we've had some good opportunities to, to work together, and I'd love to find ways to support him in his new role of, if he's fortunate enough to be elected. Senator Daschle, thank you very much. I received numerous people before, uh, leading up to this talk telling me that they hope to see you back in leadership positions in Washington, D.C. We are very fortunate and we benefit from outstanding public servants like you, and we can't thank you enough for joining us today. Thank you, Ray. I've enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me.